So what we're going to talk about is uh, today we're going to start off talking some about three mo uh, major nematodes uh, that we're targeting with our nematicide treatments. Then we're going to talk about uh, you know some of the nematicides that are out there and how they work on these nematodes because it's important if we uh, you know, for us to, to select the right program to know uh, not only what the nematodes are doing but how the uh, nematicide works. <laughs> And uh, then finally, I'm going to talk about the uh, studies we're doing with, with Harold's toward the end. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So before we get into the, you know, the new stuff, I want to talk a look, look a little bit uh, back. And uh, how many of you guys have used Nemecure in the past? Okay, most of y'all, okay? So uh, uh, Nemecure was uh, really good stuff for a long time and uh, very effective. And of course, the big thing here was this, this problem here that it was a very uh, dangerous, hazardous material, which is why it is uh, no longer with us. Interestingly enough, you know you can still use phenamophos in, in Europe, but not in, not in the US, so you, you go figure. So, uh, but anyway, uh, Indemicure was our industry standard for a long time, okay? Um, on golf courses, this was the uh, uh, primarily, uh, primary nematicide used. And for several reasons, uh, one is that it had both contact and systemic activity, which means it could uh, get the nematodes out in the soil, and it could get taken up inside the plant and get the ones inside as well, which made it uh, very uh, versatile. Okay, with Nemecure, you really didn't have to know what kind of nematode problem you had because this stuff worked on all of them, okay? Now, as we talk about our new, uh, new nematicide, some of these things were just as well or even better uh, the Nemecure in a lot of situations, but there, none of them are as versatile as Nemecure was, and we'll kind of go into uh, why that is as we go along. This does make it important to know uh, what, uh, what, our uh, what our nematodes are and how they behave and how our nematocyte behaves as well. So, uh, yeah, I started uh, early on in my career, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, when I first came back to UF, uh, you know, I graduated my, my PhD at University of Florida, went out to Texas A&M, and I was assistant professor there for a while. And uh, then when I came back, the first thing I was confronted with was you know, EPA calling me and saying, hey, you know, we're thinking about taking Nemecure off the market or have it taken off the market. Uh, they started asking all these questions. You know, one of the things they asked was, uh, well, if uh, golf courses you know, didn't have anything to use to control nematodes, couldn't they just use more water and fertilizer? Like, okay, so EPA is going to tell you guys to use more water and more fertilizer. That doesn't, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, Harold's would be happy because they sell fertilizer too, right? But um, it didn't make a whole lot of sense from an environmental standpoint. The second thing they asked me was, well, you know, Florida, 85% of the nemecure used on golf courses is used in Florida. They don't use hardly any in Tennessee. Why don't the golf courses in Florida just do what they do in Tennessee? And uh, that didn't make a whole lot of sense either. But uh, it kind of makes you question some of our uh, regulating agencies and how they think. But... So uh, I started off, you know, even before Nemecure came off the market, I, I just got to start where this was going and we need to find some alternatives. So I spent the last 20 years uh, looking at alternatives to uh, Nemecure and trying to find new ways to uh, manage these nematodes. And for a long time we were trying to you know, manage things because we didn't have anything really effective to use. Like Dr. Martin mentioned, you know, we had all these agronomic practices and these other things we were trying to use. And now we recently have now some good nematicide tools to use, and now we're kind of putting those together uh, into, into these programs. So what do I look for when I look for a nematicide? Well, one thing we want is something that's going to be reasonably safe, okay? Uh, you, may, you guys may have heard me tell the story before that this one compound we tested was the single most effective nematicide I have ever seen. We put this stuff out, and we flat out, it killed every nematode on these plots. And they, they didn't come back. A year later, there was still no nematodes in those plots. Beautiful green squares on this grass. However, the active ingredient is on the Centers for Disease Control list of uh, uh, you know, deadly chemicals and in our homeland security as a potential terrorist threat compound. Okay? So it, it not only forms a, a, a deadly odorless gas, but also is readily turned into an explosive. And so uh, that's something, we're not going to go back there, okay? That's, uh, I know uh, our uh, nematicide companies are not interested in going back to these types of dangerous things. We don't want to use them. We don't have to put all the PPE, and our, your customers don't like that either. So we want things to be reasonably safe. We're trying to move away from that skull and crossbones we had with, with Nemecure. Another thing we're going to look for is something practical. Uh, it's something that actually can be used by you guys. 
And so uh, one of the things that I've, over the years, a lot of these things we've tested, and some of them were, okay, this is, you know, had some moderate nematode activity, but to get that concentration in the soil where these nematodes are, you would have to put out 50 gallons per acre, okay? Well, that, that's not a practical treatment, okay? Or you would have to put out two tons of this product per acre, okay? That's not a practical treatment. Uh, and so uh, we spent a lot of time trying to find not only do things work, but can they be used uh, on a golf course. And finally, we, we used our research to find things that are going to be effective, because again, it doesn't do any good to put stuff out if it's not going to work, and also things that are going to be consistent. And uh, that, that's, you know, uh, again, uh, I've tested a bunch of things, and some of you guys will call me, well, Dr. Crow, what about this thing here? And I said, we've tested that 10 times. In one trial, there was a little bit of statistical difference there. It's hard for me to recommend that, okay? So we want something that's at least going to give some level of, of uh, uh, you know, predictability that's actually going to do something. Even if it's even half the time, okay? But uh, if it's only going to work one time out of 10, uh, that's uh, not going to be something I can recommend typically, but it may be something that might help in some situations. So I, I never tell you guys don't use it, but you know, if you're going to go that route, make sure you realize the expectations are uh, fairly low. So uh, I asked this question, does it matter what kind of nematodes you're, you're dealing with? And uh, so as you kind of you know, guess from where I'm going with this, uh, the answer to this is going to be yes. And we're going to go into why as we go along. So I'm going to talk about three main nematodes here today. I'm going to talk about sting nematode, root knot nematode, and lance nematode. Okay? And now there's other ones uh, that are going to be causing damage to our turf grasses here in Florida on golf courses. We got stubby root nematodes that can be a problem. We got all nematodes that are on the crease can be a problem, and a bunch of other ones. But these three probably cause 95% of the, the headaches you guys deal with from a nematode standpoint. And generally, when we target, uh, uh, when we do nematicide trials, we're looking at these three. Okay? So the first one's going to be sting nematode. Again, over the years, I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about these nematodes before, but these are a very uh, large nematode, and they are what we call an ectoparasite. So it me ecto means outside, it lives out in the soil. And so when we extract these things, you'll see here we've got juveniles and adults. These juveniles just look like little mini miniature versions of the, the adults here. You also find eggs in the soil as well. And uh, so I mean, all those life stages are out there. And this nematode does not go inside the root. It has uh, this stylet, uh, which it, uh, I don't know if you can see it from back in the back, but it's this spear that comes out and pokes into your root. And then it injects things into the plant and sucks things out. But it stays out in the soil which uh, from, a, from a management standpoint makes this nematode fairly easy to kill because it's out in the soil where it's easy to get things to it. Uh, this is the type of damage uh, sting nematode does on uh, warm season turf grasses. Okay, they, they feed on the root tips and you tend to get these abbreviated stubbed up uh, roots like this. Okay? Now on bent grass you're not going to see this but on you know, zoysia and bermuda you kind of get these symptoms. Now this is, of course is pretty severe here, but a lot of times you'll see, if you'll see these roots going down and see these little stubbed up you know, ends on them, that's often indic indicative of sting nematode or stubby root nematode cause that type of damage. And then of course, your, if your grass doesn't have a good root system, it can't take up water and nutrients and tends to decline. So uh, this nematode is really bad, but it's also, I would say, the easiest uh, nematode to actually kill because it is out in the soil all the time. And it's very large, and it seems to take up uh, chemicals pretty, pretty readily. Now, uh, what was interesting with this nematode, we started, again, looking at its vertical movement, uh, oh, probably uh, at least a dozen years ago now, we started working with this. And what we have found is that, um, you know, you, you think, you know, you know, you know turf, you know, our, our, root, our zone of protection we want activity is about, you know, let's say two to four inches deep, typically, okay? And uh, but what we have found with sting nematode is uh, it doesn't uh, stay in one spot uh, throughout the year. And it tends to have a, a lot of vertical movement. It doesn't move laterally so much, but it can move up and down quite a bit. As a matter of fact, sting nematode is the main nematode problem we have on strawberries in Florida. And what they found in strawberries over in Plant City and Dover area is uh, during the summertime, that nematode will go down three feet deep and kind of hang out down there. And they fumigate the top foot, and then they plant the strawberries, and the nematodes come back up and then start attacking the strawberries. Okay, so 
uh, it becomes very difficult to manage because there's a lot of vertical mobility. And that also is influenced by uh, your water table because this nematode doesn't like real saturated conditions. And so it behaves a little bit differently on flatwood soils like you have around Naples and Palm Beach and places differently than it does in Orlando here where your sands are deeper and uh, it has, uh, actually does a lot more, even more vertical movement. But what we found typically is during the winter time, uh, in the cooler months, this nematode moves up higher up in the soil profile and it tends to be active up top. And then in the summertime, it'll drop down here, okay, and be down, you know, uh, you know, four to eight inches deep or sometimes even deeper. So you would think sting nematode being native to Florida, it would like high temperatures, but it really doesn't. When it gets high, it kind of moves down, it kind of hangs out down there, okay? So if you're trying to manage this nematode, just, from, just think of it, uh, what the nematode's doing, when would be the best time to manage this nematode? During the cooler months, right? And so uh, we get our best efficacy from our nematicide treatments on sting nematode from spring and fall applications, okay? Uh, so uh, if you're trying to control your nematode uh, during July and August, when this nematode is down deeper, it's, stuff's got to get from there all the way down here to get to that nematode. And the nematode is down here, and most of your roots are up here. And uh, when these nematodes are down here, they're not feeding typically. And they'll, they'll eat roots that come down that deep. But, uh, but they're not very active on feeding, and they're not really active reproducing. Uh, during the cooler months, okay, uh, you know, uh, right now we're kind of at the peak of this, is when uh, these nematodes are laying all their eggs and doing all the reproduction. And during the summertime, pretty much all you get are going to be adults uh, kind of down here. So uh, typically what we see in Florida is, uh, our, like I said, our populations are increasing right now. They tend to peak about May, then they'll drop off as we move into the summer. And that is because these nematodes aren't going away, but they're dropping down deeper in the soil below typically where we're sampling. Okay. So uh, this is kind of a, a normal thing. Now, sometimes you can get high populations in the summer too, but just typically this is kind of what we see. So if we're trying to control sting nematode, okay, uh, what are the you know, properties of a good nematicide for sting nematode? Well, first of all, we want something that's going to be effective, all right? It doesn't do us any good to put out you know, the treatment that's not going to affect the nematode we're trying to manage, okay? So it's either got to kill this nematode or, or, or immobilize it or prevent it from feeding or do something, okay? Uh, now, because sting nematode stays out in the soil, we can kill it with a contact nematicide, Okay, that's because again the nematode is outside of the plant, uh, but also you could kill it with a with a uh, a uh, systemic product if it gets taken up by the plant and the nematode feeds on the plant and takes it up. Okay, so either mode of action would work on sting nematode. Now, typically though, uh, what we're trying to do is is kill this nematode with contact activity as it's out in the soil. Okay, now to do that you've got to get it through that thatch in organic matter and down to the sand where this nematode is going to stay. Okay? That means uh, in, in all of the nematicides we use with the exception of curfew, which is injected to un you know, underneath the thatch, everything else we're applying to the top and watering it and having it to move. So, your, so our nematicide has to be um, uh, you know, you're soluble in water and moved in water and be able to penetrate thatch typically to control sting nematode. Now, uh, sting nematode, uh, again, in Florida, is active almost all year round. It's actually, I'd say, you're know, probably least active in the middle of summertime. But, our, but you've got all year this nematode can reproduce and do its thing, okay? As a consequence, uh, we, uh, we don't just have to put, in Florida, we, if just putting out something that's just going to, if you apply a chemical that, only, that works very effective, but it has a very short residual activity, it's usually not going to give us all the activity we want. Okay? And uh, so curfew, for example, is very, 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 very effective on sting nematode. Okay? But it has no residual activity and you can only apply it once a year. So while it's very effective, you know, four or five months later, you, know, you may have your nematode counts back up, your grass may start declining again. And if that's the only thing you had, 
it's probably not going to get you all the, the benefit you want. It works really good, but it, it may not give us a, a year's worth of control. So, uh, so we want something that either, either we can, uh, it's going to last for a long time or something we can put out multiple times to keep our nematode population in check. And I mentioned to you because of the, where this nematode is in the soil, typically uh, we, it, our treatments work better when it's up higher up in the soil during the spring and the fall. Okay, root knot nematode is a very different animal. Okay, this one is what we call a sedentary endoparasite. And uh, I have this uh, uh, zoysia grass root here. And uh, the reason I have uh, the zoysia grass root is because on uh, zoysia grass, the root knot nematode's egg masses typically are on the outside here. Now, in Florida, we have uh, our, on our, our turf grasses, our main uh, root knot nematode species we have is Melodigine graminus. Okay, and uh, so the work I do is on Melodigine graminus. We have found Melodigine marylandi here in Florida, but it is very uh, infrequent. Uh, up in the Carolinas, where Dr. Martin's at, they have those two species. In Texas, they have a lot of the Melodigine uh, uh, marylandi and Melodigine graminus. But in Florida, it's pretty much this nematode, and so I spend a lot of time working with it. Reason I say that is because these other species may uh, behave somewhat differently, but Melodigine graminus we have found on zoysia grass, here's its egg masses. And in each of these egg masses, you can have several hundred eggs inside that egg mass. Uh, these are what these eggs look like. You see the young nematodes are pulled up inside here. These are second stage juveniles getting ready to hatch out of the egg. And uh, this is that second stage juvenile that comes out of that egg. Now, uh, when it comes out of that egg, it's going to try to find a root to attack, and it's going to go to a root tip, invade uh, in that root tip area, and uh, enter into the root. These are all uh, second stage juvenile uh, root knot nematodes that have went inside this Bermuda grass root here. We've stained them red since you can see them, but see this root is all full of these, these nematodes. Now once they get inside there, they establish a permanent feeding site and then don't move anymore. Okay, so. Uh, you see here now they're starting to swell up. Uh, they're going now. They go through several molts, getting kind of a little bigger each time. And but you see now these what we call these sausages here. Um, then they finally come and turn into typically an adult female. Okay, this is our female root knot nematode. See, she's shaped kind of like a ball there. She, she's starting to lay eggs. This is one of these females. This is inside a Bermuda grass root. And what you want to notice here on this Bermuda grass root. Is all these eggs are all inside, okay? And what we found with Melodigine graminus is on, well, on zoysia grass, it'll lay its eggs on an egg mass at the surface. On Bermuda grass, all the eggs kind of stay inside where it's hard to see them. Uh, so uh, when, these, when these eggs hatch, okay, that second stage juvenile nematode is going to come out and it's going to find a, a root tip to go to and it's going to invade, okay? So between there and here is when it's outside in the soil. Okay, the rest of the time it's inside that plant. Uh, this is a Bermuda grass root. Uh, you can see the female nematodes inside. This is this gall that swells up around that nematode. And then you see that root starting to rot. And what happens is uh, the, the roots will kind of rot off below these galls. And she end up with a real shallow root system with these, these galls all up in there. Okay? So what I have found with uh, Bolidogyne graminus, this root knot nematode, is we find almost all of them up here. Okay, and I'm going to go in here in a few minutes about you know, uh, how we found all that out. But it, it stays up here in the, up and all the, and the roots all up in the thatch and really high up in this soil thatch interface up here. You find very few down here. The uh, now so controlling a root knot nematode, okay. Again, because uh, you know it's going to be inside, it's a little bit different than the nematode. Like we want something that's going to be effective. Now, ideally for root knot nematodes, we want something systemic, okay, because this nematode spends the majority of its life inside that root, okay. And the only stage that's going to be outside of where it can get to with contact nematicides is that second stage juvenile before, when it comes out of a root before it goes back into another one, okay? Because that nematode stays up in the top, 
Okay, we want something that's going to bind up and thatch and kind of hang out up there. We work best on this particular nematode. Okay? Now, this is different than sting nematode. We want things to go through the thatch for sting nematode. For root knot nematode, we want it to stay up in that top you know, inch or so where that nematode tends to stay. Now, ideally, again, we want something that's either going to stay up in there and all that thatch should be there for a long time, or something we can apply uh, repeatedly over time. Okay, because uh, then as the material starts breaking down or disappearing, we apply some more. Okay, to keep enough of it up there to get multiple generations of these nematodes if you have a contact nematocyte. Our third uh, major nematode is going to be Lance nematode. Uh, this is what we call a migratory endoparasite. It goes inside the plant and tun tunnels around. Okay, so. Uh, it, it'll go uh, tunnel into the root, tunnel around in there, tunnel back out of the root, and tunnel in and out and around all the time, uh, feeding as it does. Uh, you see these, this root here, these are all you know, lance nematodes tunneling around inside. You'll find a bunch of them out in the soil, you'll find them inside the roots as well. Okay? This nematode is our most difficult nematode to manage, uh, and I would say we really don't have any real good treatments for this particular nematode. Okay, so this uh, this is one that uh, is very, very difficult. Now, it is also probably the least damaging of these three nematodes, okay? But uh, it is the most difficult to control. Uh, what it does is it tunnel around in the, tunnels around in these roots, making Swiss cheese out of your roots, then fungi get in, you get all this rotting that happens, and you get these you know, rotten roots with no, no fibrous root system, okay? So nice healthy roots have nice white roots, that Dr. Martin talked about, nice, you know, fine fibrous roots, taking up water and nutrients. These roots here aren't taking up much of anything, okay? As a consequence, then, our grass tends to decline, and then you get these, you know, these thin patches, there go. grass will kind of wear out over here in areas, all this spurge coming in, and that's no fun, okay? So we want to avoid this if we can. Now, uh, like I mentioned, uh, lance nematodes uh, are, uh, I've done a lot of, throughout my career, uh, working with sting nematode, and the last, uh, you know, 10 years, we've done a lot on root knot nematodes, and now we're hitting lance nematodes, big time, in my research program. Uh, we just got a grant from the GCSAA with matching from the Florida Golf Course Superintendents, uh, looking at lance nematodes and trying to determine a lot of the behavior, what's the best way to diagnose these, and uh, what's uh, refining our thresholds, and uh, finding out, uh, you know, do thresholds mean something different on treated versus untreated turf and these things. So you'll be hearing me talk a lot about lance nematodes coming up. Controlling lance nematode, we want something, again, that's going to be effective. Okay. Now, uh, again, because it spends a lot of time inside the plant, ideally we want something systemic. Okay. But if we don't have something systemic, we want something that's going to work that we can either apply and it's going to stay there a long time and get the nematodes that crawl out of the root. Uh, or uh, something we can apply repeatedly over time, okay? So let's talk about uh, some of our tools we have. Um, the first uh, material I want to talk about is abamectin. Now, abamectin's been around since the 1970s. Like, it's been around for a long, long time, and it is, is off patent. Uh, Divinim is uh, Syngenta's uh, formulation, a very good formulation of this. But there are also some generics out there as well because this is off patent. Uh, so right now, uh, Polypro has Total, uh, Right Line, Nemomectin is another generic formulation of abamectin. Uh, there's probably going to be some others. Uh, you know, I've been uh, testing some other generic uh, abamectin formulations. So there'll probably be some other ones coming up too. So, but uh, all of these tend to work similar, similarly. There may be some formulation differences and things. And, uh, but uh, what I'm going to talk about, because um, almost all the research we've done has been uh, with Syngenta, and so uh, when I talk about uh, my research with abamectin, it's all going to be with Avid or Divinim. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I, I've done so, just you know, minimal work with these other formulations. So uh, thank you to Syngenta people for helping fund <laughs> uh, all this work with abamectin. I mean, I started working with that stuff in 1999 when I started working with abamectin on turf grass. So worked with it for a long time. So um, abamectin has se several unique uh, properties. One is, is a very, very effective nematocyte. 
Okay, if nematodes come in contact with it at very low concentrations, it will kill them. Okay, so uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, back uh, a few years ago, we had an old guy come by our nematode diagnostic lab, dropping off a nematode sample from his garden, and he was, he was telling me, "Oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a retired agricultural chemist. I used to work for Merck, and I helped discover nematicide back in the early 1970s." And I was like, well, why, why was that? He says, abomectin. I said, so we're doing stuff with abomectin now. He says, oh, but, but it, does, it, has, it doesn't move in soil. <laughs> and I said, well, fortunately, I don't have to get it down very deep. Okay? So the big drawback to abomectin is, uh, well, historically, has always been it doesn't move. Like it's a very large molecule. It's a very, very, very high absorption coefficient. means it binds to soil particles, binds to organic matter. And so, which is a problem, if you think about it, if you're trying to control nematodes on, on peanuts, you have to get your nematicide down that deep, okay? If you put, in, in, in abomectin just doesn't do that, okay? When they've, uh, they've tried using it in ag, putting it through drip lines, okay, underneath plastic, and it just stays right around that drip line, it doesn't move, okay? It, it is very, very immobile, okay? But, uh, and so, uh, if you think about our thatch as being a sponge up here on top of this, you know, uh, it, it just doesn't get through there. As a matter of fact, a uh, study done at, at NC State, they found that less than 2% of abomectin applied topically at a turf and then watered in, less than 2% of it actually makes it through the thatch. Okay, so 98% of your nematicide is staying up here in all that thatch and organic layer, okay? It has a half-life of about, you know, uh, I'd say, you know, greater than or equal to 14 days. Somewhere between 14 and 50-some days is the half-life in, in soil, okay? Now, uh, I will tell you that, that exposed to sunlight, it breaks down really quickly. Exposed to sunlight, the half-life is three hours, okay? So when you put this stuff out, you've got to water it in really quick, okay? But uh, in soil, it lasts for, I'd say, two weeks to a month, typically, okay? Uh, it is uh, much safer than Nemacure. I uh, we went from a danger label, now we're at a warning label. It is restricted use pesticide. But so, but what you found here with our abomectin, okay, uh, it's pretty much all going to stay up here. Now, what nema are those, which of those three nematodes do you think it would work best on? Root knot, right? Because that's where root knot nematode stays. Okay, and it's interesting, uh, I, like I said, I mentioned I've been working with abomectin for a long, long time. Uh, you see here, these are uh, some of my uh, nematicide treated plots. And, it was, and it's interesting because we were, we were doing, you know, probably, you know, uh, let's say eight, nine years ago, we were doing all these, these experiments with Avid, with uh, Syngenta, and we were trying to control sting nematodes, okay? So we had these sting nematode sites like this. See this voice is full of sting nematodes here. And we put out this avid. We get these nice green squares on here. And we take our nematode counts. And, and guess, guess what level of, of control we got? None. OK? I have never had statistical reductions in sting nematode from <laughs> these topical applications with avid. And, it, it, and so what in the world's going on? Why am I getting these really nice, I'm putting this nematicide, getting a great response, and no, uh, no nematode control? And that's what really got us looking at all this vertical movement, where these, thing, these, these nematodes are going, and how they separate out in the soil. That's where we found out that the root knot nematodes stay up high, the sting nematodes stayed a little bit lower. And uh, interestingly enough, I would always get these positive responses. Uh, from uh, my abomectin treatments when I was putting out in the summertime when the sting nematode was down lower and what all is going on there, okay? Uh, this is, again, you may have seen this. This is an aerial drone photo of, some, uh, again, this uh, sting nematode uh, infested Bermuda grass here. And in this case, we're actually testing another product. We had the uh, abomectin as a standard. And you see these nice green squares. The other treatment wasn't working. But these nice green squares where we put our abomectin Again, no sting nematode control, okay? So, um, again, we started looking at depth and things to find out where these nematodes were. And uh, one of the things we found, like I said, is our root knot stays up there. Now, when we're doing soil extractions, we send a sample in to our uh, nematode assay lab. Uh, we use this, what's called this Jenkins 
extraction method. Okay, and it's the mechanical method for separating nematodes from sand. Okay, and so uh, we we take uh, this uh, the sand and soil down here and extract our nematodes out. It uses mechanical process. Guess what we do with this? We throw it away, okay? Uh, and so what we found out was we we're throwing away almost all of our root knot nematodes. And uh, what the, the root knot nematodes you typically find down here, you'll find some, okay? But typically these are the kind of sick ones that are not, very, not infective. They're covered with this bacteria, pasture we find on them, and infected by fungi, not very healthy ones, okay? But the healthy ones are all up here, okay? So then, okay, so well, maybe, Maybe on those sites we're trying to control sting nematode, maybe we were controlling root knot nematodes we didn't even know were there because we had the wrong extraction method for all these years. And so we had to come up with a better way of extracting these nematodes. And so what we uh, built was a uh, mist chamber uh, and then developed protocols for extracting these root knot nematodes using this uh, mist chamber. So what we do, we take four inch and a half diameter turf plugs Okay, so if this was a putting green, you would take uh, four of these uh, from uh, symptomatic areas. Uh, we, in the lab, we, wash, we actually wash the sand off and just leave the, the uh, turf plug here with the adhering roots and that stuff. We put these on this coffee filter on this funnel, and our mister comes on uh, every hour for a few seconds just to kind of keep it wet and kind of keep it draining a little bit. And, and those, those juvenile, those eggs inside those roots, the little juvenile nematode hatches, comes out of the root, and then it gets washed onto the filter, it crawls through the filter, and, and ends up down here in these flasks where we now have our nematodes in water. Okay, so we started doing this and found out this was a lot better way of extracting these root knot nematodes. Uh, this, these are from uh, just five different uh, trials here. And in each of these trial we, trials, we have between 30 and 50 uh, individual uh, uh, sets of samples we were doing. We extracted the uh, nematodes from soil using the Jenkins method and extracted our root knot nematodes uh, from the mist uh, using the mist extraction. So the yellow bars are well extracted from the soil. The green is well extracted from the mist. And again, each of these different experiments is 30 to 50 plots. You see here on this Jones dwarf here, We've, we had just very, very few from the soil. We had over 400 extracted from the mist. Uh, in this tiff dwarf, we had no, no root knot nematodes in the soil. We had about 100 from the mist. Uh, this one here, I think we had one or two from the soil and about a, you know, 80 or so from the mist. Here's some tiff eagle. We had about 50 from the soil and about 300 from the mist. This one here, we had about 150 from the soil about 800 or so from the mist. So again, consistently getting a lot better uh, uh, recovery of our root knot nematodes. And now when we go back to those same spots where we got the positive responses on our sting nematodes, uh, when our sting nematode sites, we got good positive curve responses and no sting nematode control, we found that we were full of root knot nematodes and that when we put our abomectin out, we now are controlling our root knot nematodes, which is why we're getting those positive turf responses. So uh, that was kind of our process for that. Uh, when we first started implementing this, uh, you guys may have seen this, this is from a, a golf course down in Naples, where they had all these yellow blotchy symptoms. And they sent samples into our lab to extract nematodes from the soil. And we're below threshold on everything. And uh, I think we've had like two root knot nematode juveniles. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's try our new mist extraction on this. We extracted our nematodes from the mist, found out these roots were just full of root knot nematodes. And so we, uh, we put, on, put them on an abomectin program and got this, this really nice recovery uh, from uh, our abomectin treatments on root knot nematodes. So in general, uh, with abomectin, it gives us, it's an excellent root knot nematode product, okay? Now, it'll kill any other nematode it contacts, but because it doesn't move very well, it doesn't get down really deep, typically, where a lot of these other nematodes stay. So it has some activity on all these other nematodes, but not real, real good, okay? So it's what I consider, for me, I consider this a root knot nematode product, okay? You may get some incidental control of other nematodes, and occasionally, uh, you know, you may see some reductions in research trials 
but it's few and far between, okay? <laughs> but it works really good on root knot nematodes because it has very poor movement and it does line up on a lot of thatch and stuff where that nematode tends to, to hang out, okay? So it's important uh, when you use abomectin that you irrigate uh, immediately to get that stuff off the top because it breaks down very rapidly in the sunlight. Uh, we have found that it works uh, better when we can tank mix it with a good soil penetrant. And so now in uh, most of my research, we're using a fleet, uh, Harold's uh, uh, wetting agent we put with it, and that seems to help. Uh, you don't necessarily get better nematode control, but it helps the chemical disperse through all that batch and stuff, and we do get better responses with it. Uh, and uh, we find that we get good, best results if you use it in conjunction with a good fungicide program. And if you think about, remember when I talked about those root knot nematodes and it kind of rots off below those galls, and, uh, and so you get a lot of fungi getting in there and stuff, and so when you put out your nematicide with your fungicide, you're kind of helping not only the nematodes, but also suppressing those fungi that may help, uh, may prevent the grass from recovering. So you get a better, not necessarily nematode control, but better, but better turf response. And we've had good turf responses with a number of different fungicides. You, of course, heritage is the classic example, but we've got good, uh, uh, better responses when we combine it with uh, anything from chlorothalonil. We've done it with clearies. We've done it with iprodione, a bunch of different fungicides. And it's always good to rotate those things, too. Okay, so uh, like I said, you know, Divinium is uh, Syngenta's uh, uh, formulation. It's a very good formulation. Now, the old Avid we had, you know, we used to use for a while, it was uh, designed uh, as, as, a, as a foliar spray insecticide. And so you have material that, that not only didn't move very well, but wasn't formulated to move very well either. So uh, Divinium is an improvement on that. It does move a little bit better than, uh, than Avid did. It still doesn't move great, but it moves a little bit better. Um, now, uh, you can do, uh, you're, you're limited if you're using in any of these abomectin products, uh, but with Divinim, you're limited to this 50 fluid ounces per acre per year is the normal rate, okay? And so you can split it up different ways. You can do, you know, uh, 16 applications of three ounces. You can do four applications of 12 ounces. And this is kind of what I recommend is doing four applications of 12. Uh, now, Syngenta does have this new spot treatment rate. The difference here is the normal rate is 12.2 fluid ounces per acre. This is 12.2 fluid ounces per 10,000 square feet. And you can do this up to four times to hit up your, you know. Uh, so these spot treatment rates are kind of where these nematicide things are going. It gets a little confusing. But I guess the idea is that instead of treating a whole acre, you're just doing part of an acre so you can put out a whole acre's worth on that little bit, okay? So, uh, and, and I've done, uh, uh, for, I've been working with a spot treatment rate for several years. Uh, Dr. Martin, you've probably done a lot with that too. Uh, I'd say it, it does work better than the 12.2 ounces per acre, uh, but I've got really good results doing this initial application with the spot treatment rate and then doing my follow-up applications with the the, the older high rate, okay? It's, it, for me, it's always worked just as well as doing, as doing four applications of that spot treatment rate. But uh, again, you may have some severe problems that may be a benefit, but you don't have to use the whole you know, thing throughout because that does get fairly expensive. Uh, currently, uh, Divinim is the only abomectin product that has that spot treatment rate, although I'm sure these, these generics will be trying to get theirs on there too. Okay, so I do recommend four applications of 12.2 ounces either per acre or per 10,000 square feet at uh, four week intervals. And again, the idea because, uh, again, remember, we're only getting root knot nematode juveniles so they come out of that root, right? Remember our half-life is about two, two weeks to a month, and so it starts breaking down after a few weeks. So about the time it starts breaking down, we apply some more, okay? And then, because nematodes are inside the roots, they're still alive and healthy, they're going to go through their life cycle, lay more eggs, and so those come out, then we hit them again, and after several applications of this, we start knocking our populations down and getting our responses, okay? So doing one application of, of Divinim is probably not going to do a whole lot for you. It takes several before it really starts uh, working because you get multiple generations of these nematodes. Okay, now let's talk about Indemnify. And Indemnify also has several unique uh, properties which affect how it works. Uh, uh, 
interestingly enough, one of the interesting things about this is it was, or, as you guys probably already know, uh, it was originally developed as a fungicide. It's an SDHI fungicide that, for some reason, is a good nematicide too. Okay, and uh, it is kind of unique among these SDHI fungicides in having this type of mode of action. As you can imagine, once Bear started doing stuff with fluopyrium, uh, every company that had a SDHI fungicide had me testing it to see if theirs controlled nematodes too. And uh, none of them really worked like fluopyram does as far as uh, giving our nematode control. So that's kind of unique. Uh, and, but it is also in a number of, uh, you'll have ag, formulation, or ag formulations, turf formulations, you'll have fungicide formulations, and, and, and nematicide formulations. Okay, so uh, of course, Xteris is our turf fungicide that has some uh, fluopyram in it. Uh, be aware that the amount of uh, fluopyram in this is, is very small compared to what's in Indemnify, and it's also not formulated uh, uh, to penetrate soil like Indemnify is. So if you're using Xteris, you may get some, some, resid some uh, incidental nematode control, but it typically is not going to be as effective as if you would have went with, with Indemnify. Okay, now the second characteristic uh, that's really unique with Indemnify, fluopyram, is it's a very, very long-lived molecule. Okay, the half-life on this stuff's like a year. Okay, so I don't know of any other turf pesticide that stays around that long. Okay, so it can give us a really long period of control. Uh, it is uh, limited to 0.39 fluid ounces per thousand square feet per year. But as with the Divinim, they have the spot treatment label where you can apply, you know, 0.39 fluid ounces per thousand up to four times. Okay. On, on if you're doing 10,000 square feet areas or less, okay? So uh, again, these spot treatments seem to be the way things are going, which is good because it allows you to do uh, higher rates or multiple applications on a uh, putting green, okay? And also, if you've got larger areas, you're managing ball fields or something, if you just got a few problem areas, you can just spot treat those few problem areas. You don't have to treat the whole, the whole place. Uh, now again, we remember we went from skull and crossbones to warning. Now with the caution label, okay, this is a very, very safe material. I tell my graduate students, you know, this, I, when I was a graduate student, I worked with Timic, you know. Uh, that was fun stuff, wasn't it, Dr. Martin? Worked really well, uh, but uh, I tell my students, you know, the stuff I worked with, the LD50s on, 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 on my stuff was, was like 10,000 times lower than what we're working with now. So uh, we made great strides moving away from... Uh, these organophosphate and carbamate nerve toxins and moving into more uh, safer chemistries because you know I don't like putting on PPE y'all don't like putting on PPE and uh, as well as uh, you know less environmental effects and things like that so we've definitely made a, a lot of uh, really positive uh, inroads there okay now indemnify it's not only labeled for golf it's also labeled for athletic fields lawns and even sod farms Although no sod farm could, apply, uh, could afford to use it, they could if they wanted to, okay? And it has some limited uh, use on lawns. So some of the high-end zoysia lawns uh, are, are using some indemnify, and they can be used to spot treatment on athletic fields. Uh, if you're treating an athletic field, you know, most of your wear is around where the, you know, the end zones and stuff. You don't have to treat the whole place. You can just treat those, those bad areas if you can afford it. So, uh, remember the first thing we talk about is efficacy, and so when we first started working with fluopyram, we did a bunch of bench screens to kind of see if the, uh, the, uh, how effective it was on different uh, nematodes that affect turf grasses. And so what we do is, is uh, we expose our, our, nemat our nematodes to increasing uh, amounts of, of our nematocyte, okay? And so this is uh, looking at eff efficacy of fluopyram on sting nematode. This is what we, a normal dose response, okay? As you increase the amount of fluopyram the nematodes are exposed to, the better it works, okay? So very effective on sting nematode. If we look at the, uh, con the activity on uh, root knot nematodes, again, nice dose response here as we increase our amounts of fluopyram, uh, getting very good uh, control of root knot nematodes. Now, in our, in our bench screens, though, with lance nematode, we haven't found that. Like, we've done this a bunch of times, and this is kind of what we see. Uh, numbers all over the place, and no statistical differences, nothing to indicate that, uh, in my research, that fluopyram is effective on lance nematode. 
Uh, I've also not had very good success with it on spiral nematode either. Interestingly enough, those two nematodes are closely related. Uh, they're both in the Hoplomidae family, and maybe for whatever reason, uh, this, uh, this AI uh, doesn't seem to be as effective on those nematodes as it is on almost every other nematode. Uh, we uh, this did studies with it, looking at it for systemic activity. We use these uh, split pot uh, system like this, where we have sand with uh, nematodes in both sides, and we'll have we use St. Augustine grass with stolons going back and forth. So it's kind of uh, uh, everything kind of comes back and forth between these, and on the top, and we have we'll put our nematocyte on one side, and if it controls nematodes here, we know it had contact activity. If it controls nematodes over here, it means that it moves systemically inside the plant over to here. Okay, so this is how we test for systemic activity in turf grass. And uh, basically, uh, if you look here, and in a good systemic product, you'll have a nematode control on both sides compared to untreated here. Okay, We're in, with indemnify, we got good control on the treated side, but not on the untreated side, indicating that it does not have good systemic activity. Okay, it's a, it's a contact product. So uh, I showed you those uh, bent screens, how this is working in the field on these three nematodes. Uh, this is a trial we did uh, early on looking at root knot nematodes. Now, this is our untreated control here, this white line. Now, the reason these things jump from here up to there is this is when we started using our mist extraction. So we asked our initial counts we did from the soil, then we started using the mist. You can see we got a whole lot more nematodes here, but so this is our untreated. And we had uh, one application of the 0.39 fluid ounces of indemnify, which is the green line. The yellow line is two applications of a half rate, and the red line is four applications at monthly intervals of the 0.39 fluid ounce rate. And you'll see that the single application early on worked, but, that, but it starts breaking down over time, the, the control. The uh, two applications of a lower rate actually work better and give us a little bit longer period of control here. And four applications kind of control the nematodes throughout here. So, our efficacy from uh, on root knot nematodes seem to be really good early on, but it does seem to kind of dissipate the further out, out from that application. Now, didn't I say this stuff lasts for like a year? So why, why, why is that, okay? Uh, so um, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is uh, on a uh, ultradorf Bermuda grass screen here. This is these root knot nematode symptoms, these yellow blotches here. You see this nice uh, tr plot treated with a fluopyram, nice turf response. And uh, this happened, it happens pretty quick, okay, on these, uh, with these root knot nematodes. If we look at sting nematodes and lance nematodes, this is from, uh, from a, one trial. Uh, here we did both, uh, we had both sting nematodes and lance nematodes. And we put our, we applied our fluopyram back here in early September, okay? And what you'll see here, this, now this is sting nematode here. This is our, our, our untreated control. This is our, our treated, uh, you know, indemnified treated plot. And you see that uh, we applied it back here in September. The next February, okay, this is our untreated control. This is our fluopyram treated. We're still doing a good job controlling our sting nematodes, you know, eight months after application. This is now the same putting green. Look at what happens with our lance nematodes. Now, in this case, again, you see nice statistical separation, but in this case, this is our untreated control, and this is our indemnify treated. Okay, we had three times as many nematodes there. Okay, now why might that be? Well, okay, if fluopyrum isn't really controlling lance nematodes, but we're controlling our, our sting nematodes pretty well, okay, what happens to these roots now? R roots are, are able to grow because sting nematodes are really bad, so we're knocking those out, getting a good root system. And now root lance nematode, which is, l is less damaging than sting nematode is, it has a lot of new roots to feed on, okay? And so it's able to, to feed and, and, and increase um, in, the, in the absence of having to compete with those sting nematodes. Okay, uh, we also did these trials with these columns like this. We had Bermuda grass with and without thatch. And what we found out that we had thatch, that, a lot, that the fluopyrium uh, early on kind of stuck up in the thatch and slowly came out, okay? 
And so we find out that when we apply our indemnify, it, it tends to kind of most of it, not all of it, but most of it will be kind of caught up here. And then slowly over time, it'll kind of work its way out of that and start going down deeper in the soil. Now, if you're depending on, remember, if you're depending on irrigation to move this material, okay, if we're irrigating all the time, you're just kind of wet in the same top part of the soil all the time, right? You're not really pushing things down. And so uh, often it's not until you start to get a lot of rain, uh, rain events to really start moving this stuff down deeper uh, before it really starts controlling sting nematodes real well. Okay? And about the time it does that, it quits working up here on the, the root knot nematodes. It's, it's working on root knot nematodes and not sting nematodes, and now it's working on sting nematodes and not root knot nematodes anymore. Okay, so uh, I, we had a golf course superintendent not uh, in, in our area dropped off samples here a while back, and and uh, he said he had all these lance nematodes. He said, "Well, I put put indemnify, and like the next by next week, my grass was getting better." I said, "I bet you had root knot nematodes in there too." Well, they didn't have any in the samples. I said, "Well, take some some uh, plugs and send them to us." We tested his plugs, and he had like two thousand you know per, per sample uh, coming out of those things. So, yeah, you get response. That response you're seeing is from those lance nematodes. Okay, so indemnify has excellent contact activity, limited mobility through thatch, very persistent, so you can't get long-term benefit from it. Uh, but, it, but remember, it doesn't stay in one spot. Even though it's there for a long time, it can either be up here or down there, or where, depending on where your nematodes you're trying to control are, may or may not be doing all that we want it to be. But it is not very good on lance nematodes. So uh, this is from one of my trials. Uh, what you see here is, uh, this is a cup uh, taken from an indemnified treated plot. This is a cup taken from an untreated plot. Okay? We have a lot more lance nematodes here than we do there. Okay? Is that an issue? I would much rather have this than I would that. I mean, not you would know. I mean, that, remember, our goal to managing nematodes is not to lower counts, is to have a healthy root system. Okay? So our objective always should be, our main objective is to have a healthy root system. And, and I spend most of my phone calls and emails I get are from superintendents all worried about their counts. Okay? <laughs> the main <laughs> email and phone call issue I deal with are people stressing out about these counts. Okay? And as long as your grass, as your roots are doing good, uh, you can monitor those counts and kind of see where they're at, but don't freak out about them, okay? It's not uncommon to get more nematodes when you have a, health, a better root system, okay? So this should be our focus. Okay, comparing these two uh, nematicides, again, indemnify uh, works good on root knot and sting nematodes, but it does not very work very well on, on lance nematode. Abamectin works really good on root knot nematodes and it's less effective on all these other ones just because of its lack of movement. Uh, both of these are contact nematicides. Uh, the uh, abamectin is not very long lived, but if you do monthly applications, I say you can get four months of, of activity with it because you're applying it every month for four months. Whereas indemnify, I can get up to eight months of activity from a single application of indemnify. Again, we've made great strides here. Uh, going from our skull and crossbones to a warning and caution labels. Okay, so uh, we're doing a lot of a lot of good things, and our industry is moving in the right direction here. Uh, this is uh, Tom, my field technician, who just retired last month. He has emailed me this morning, asking me how things were going, if everything fell apart, and since he retired. But uh, uh, this is Tom applying Nemacure, and, and we don't like having to put all that PPE, right? We want to be able to put stuff on here with just minimal PPE. And this is kind of where we've gone to now as opposed to that. So that, that's a good thing. Okay, so let me talk about what we've done with Harold's. Uh, like Dr. Martin mentioned, uh, one of the major limitations that we have at the university is funding, okay? Uh, because uh, you know, I've got uh, four, four full-time people, three graduate students, and two part-time people that all of them are paid on soft money. That means I've got to come up with money to pay these people. Okay, and I can, without them, I can't do anything, but I need to do stuff to bring in money to do them. That means that you can do very little without funding. Okay, so funding is very important. And one of the good things about Harold's is they are funding us on the experiments, which I'm thankful for. And it's also cool because Harold's, uh, you know, being more of a distributor, they have a number of different products 
They're selling, uh, you know, other other you know, companies' products. They're, they're selling as well as stuff they're doing themselves. So it's kind of cool because we're doing trials for bear. We're testing bear chemistries. We're doing stuff with Syngenta. We're testing Syngenta chemistries. Now we can kind of put everything together in more of a program approach. So uh, this experiment we're doing for Harold's. Uh, there's four treatments, okay, and uh, the, the first treatment is our untreated control. It just gets the fleet wetting agent, okay. Our second treatment is, uh, is this, uh, is our, what I call my jungle juice program, okay, and uh, uh, again, I'll tell you all what's all in that here in just a minute. Basically, it's your Harold's Root Health program, which uh, when I started this, they didn't, they didn't have that, so I made up my own term for it, so I called it jungle juice, and then uh, Dr. Schneider and, and, and Jason came, and I said, I'm calling this jungle juice, and they're, oh, we don't like that. Yeah, use that term. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> I should have copywritten that before I told those guys. But uh, anyway, so with this jungle juice program, and then I have my nematicide program, and then I have a combination which has a combination of both of these programs. Okay, so what all's in this? Okay, so we're putting out a lot of stuff. Okay, so our, our uh, basically our nematicide program is two applications of indemnify in the fall, two in the spring, and then in between during the summertime we're doing four applications of Divinil. Okay, so we are putting on a whole bunch of nematicide on these plots. Okay, so I'm glad I don't have to pay for it. But, uh, but uh, we are, but this we're using kind of our maximum uh, you know, nematicides we can use here. And then our jungle juice program, what we have is our, our fleet, and everything gets fleet in this trial, eight applications. And then we're doing uh, Harold's seaweed material, which I think, uh, uh, not this time, Dr. Schneider's talked to you guys about before, I'm sure. Uh, there's seaweed, Earthmax, which are another uh, uh, Harold's uh, product, and then their root enhancers. So it kind of gets a lot of stuff. When you mix all this stuff together, I mean, I, I grew up in, in the farms near, near uh, Immokalee, okay, and you know the old ditch water? It's kind of brown look, you know. That's what this stuff looks like. So I didn't want to call it dirty ditch water, so I called it jungle juice instead. But uh, so uh, now uh, we're like we're doing taking a number of different measurements on this, and we're doing turf color, we're doing turf per, uh, percent uh, green cover. This year we started doing NDVI measurements on this as well. But uh, last year, basically what we saw here throughout the uh, you know from uh, March through uh, December here uh, is that anything that got the nematicides was better than anything that didn't. Okay, so uh, the blue lines here are untreated. The gray is our jungle juice. The uh, yellow, or the the orange is our nematicide program, and the yellow is the combination. So above ground, okay, our uh, nematicides and, and combination programs were, were doing good. Uh, but uh, we didn't see much uh, from the jungle juice program by itself. Now let me mention that uh, one of the reasons uh, we picked this particular spot is I picked on purpose plots that had sting nematodes, lance nematodes, and root knot nematodes. Okay, so we got a lot of nematodes in the screen that we're dealing with here. Okay, if uh, again looking at above ground, this kind of averages across the, the, the time period. Because throughout here, you'll see here where we core aerified and top dressed and stuff is why those kind of take those downturns there. But uh, on, on average, uh, this sort of nematicide program or combination program did better than the untreated or the jungle juice as far as percent green cover and in in color. Okay. Now that being said, that's statistically looking at these plots. Okay. Uh, this is uh, you can see following aerification. Uh, this is are my nematicide program. This is my combination program. Which one looks better to you? That one sure looks better to me than that. And uh, this is, uh, look at those same plots uh, later in the year. Again, this is my combination program. Uh, this is uh, my nematicide program. That looks a lot better than that to me, okay? Now this is looking at another set of plots from the same experiment, but again, I've got my uh, nematicide program over here and my combination program. This is this past February. These are from last year's treatments, okay? And so, we, and this, so we, we've since now started applying our programs this year. But uh, this, these green squares you've seen are from last year's applications. And still, that one there is looking a little bit better than that one to me. But for whatever reason, it doesn't show up statistically. So 
Uh, take that for what it's worth. Okay, so below ground, uh, we see that our combination program uh, is where we had our best uh, root, uh, root lengths here. This is our yellows, our combination. Did even better than the nematicide program by itself. Okay, and so it seemed to be that when we applied the, the, the jungle juice with the nematicides, it really helped promote our root growth. Now, in our, in our uh, severe nematode infestation, though, the jungle juice program by itself didn't seem to improve our roots. Okay? This is what was really intriguing to me, is looking at our, our nematode counts. Uh, now, uh, because we had sting nematodes, lance nematodes, and root knot nematodes, I, we did both soil and mist extractions on these. Okay? And so, um, this is looking at my, my numbers of sting nematodes. Uh, from the soil, this is what we got from the, the, the mist, which you don't get many sting nematodes from our mist, but I kind of put that in there anyway. But uh, if you look here, here's our untreated control and our jungle juice programs. Our nematode counts increased. This is our nematicide program. This is our combination. So our, uh, you see that our, our combination program actually gave us better sting nematode control than the nematicide program by itself. Don't know why that is yet. We can hope to continue our work with Harold's and kind of get trying to figure out why that is. But I was very interested in seeing that. Okay, now uh, what you'll see here in our mist, I just put this up here just to show you that the sting count zeroed out in that combination treatment throughout this whole whole trial there. Uh, looking at our root knot nematodes, uh, now uh, if you look here, now what I haven't told you, remember I told you when I was showing this, this root knot nematode life cycles? I told you how the, you know, the, at the last mold turns into an adult female. Well, the, the species we have here in Florida, Melodigine graminus, it has sex. Okay, so uh, they have male nematodes and female nematodes, and they make babies the old fashioned way. Okay, so in that last mold, the males come out, turn into males, and they can actually come out of the root looking for females. Okay, uh, so uh, we, we, uh, in our mist extraction, we get both juveniles and males. Okay, and uh, now the other species I talked about, Melodica marylandi, it, it reproduces it, it, it parthenogenically. It doesn't have it doesn't uh, have sex, and it, it, the female the babies are clones of the female. And so uh, in our samples, you can kind of I'm sorry, I get excited about this stuff, Doctor Bart. She's laughing at me. So, <laughs> but but you can but it's easy to kind of tell if you got Melodica graminus or not because if you got a bunch of males. If you get this is going to be graminus. If you got just if it's all female, all juveniles and no males. Uh, it's usually going to be Marylandi, but anyway, we had this uh, uh, big uh, outbreak of this uh, nematode killing bacteria, this Pasteur Benetrans, in these plots last year, and so the populations kind of went down throughout. But what I want you to notice here is that uh, at the end, and our combination program was the only thing statistically lower than the untreated, and there were zero juveniles. There were, I think, only two males we found in that combination treatment at the end. Again, it was the only thing statistically different from the untreated. So once again, our combination program seemed to not only help us control sting nematodes, but also help us control root knot nematodes. Now, unfortunately, lance nematodes, they kind of did their thing, and so these are our nematicide treated and our combination. You see it had more nematodes than the untreated control. So, uh, but again, that's kind of what we expected, because neither divinim nor indemnify or work really well on, on, on lance nematodes. So in summary, uh, with our jungle juice program, we found that uh, in, in now, uh, again, what I'm seeing is going to be different. Typically when Dr. Schneider and them are doing trials, they're doing these on places without nematodes, okay? But when under high nematode pressure, the jungle juice didn't seem to do much for me by itself. But boy, I tell you, when I put that stuff with the nematicides, I get better nematode control and better root responses. Okay, so uh, I do think that what, kind of a, the, the uptake to that story from the first year at least is that if you're going to spend all this money going, putting all these root health products, uh, you need to control your nematodes too. Okay, if you've got a big nematode problem, you're not going to out, I always sort of outgrow the nematodes. Eh, I don't really don't, I don't necessarily buy that, uh, but, but if you control the nematodes, then you'll get a really good response from the, uh, the uh, root health program. Uh, this is uh, just uh, is a, a golf course uh, up near Jacksonville, and uh, just showing you. Uh, you see these, you know, areas here. We got these nematode declining areas. 
uh, when we grid this off, you'll find that there's areas that are high in sting nematodes, there's some areas that are high in lance nematodes. Uh, there's areas here where we have like over 2,000 sheathoid nematodes or ring nematodes per 100 cc's of soil. Now, if you look at these spots though, I mean, you don't know, these all may be caused by sting nematode. You may have sting nematode causing this one and lance nematode causing this one, okay? And so uh, it's, Im it's important when you're sampling to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, that you have different nematodes in there, maybe kind of all occurring together. And, uh, but it is important because to know what kind of nematode you're dealing with to really help you select your best program to managing these nematodes. So we sample to know what kind of nematodes we have. And uh, it's important to, know, to study how the nematodes behave because the best nematocyte in the world, world isn't going to work unless it, it and the nematode come in contact, right? So we have to study the nematode's behavior and the movement and, and behavior of the nematocyte as well. And so how those interact really affect our program. Uh, this again, this is in February. Uh, this is uh, the roots in my uh, combination program, my jungle juice nematocyte program, and my untreated controls there. Again, really nice uh, uh, response. And again, this is what we want. We want a nice, healthy, healthy root system. That's, that should always be the goal of our management program. Uh, thank you. If you want to get hold of me, my email, you can follow me on Twitter up here. Uh, you can call me. I'm not in the office very much, but uh, you can do your best to try to call me that way. You're better off emailing me, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you.